Okay, we have one more brilliant presentation to look forward to. Dr. Ross Tucker is going to talk to us about concussions and his research on concussions, in particular, in the effect in women's sports. And then at the end of that, we have free drinks for everyone at the bar. So stick it out. Go see Jason at the bar after Ross is done talking, and we can socialize and let down for a little bit. Okay? Thank you. Jeez, I'd better be quick then. <clears throat> now that you've thrown that uh, prospect in the, in the future. Okay, so... Um, the, the, this is this is something of a different topic. It's it's um, from the world of my day job, which is to work with world rugby, where I study concussions. And one of the one of the big challenges we've got is trying to get a handle on concussion in women, because it turns out that there may be some significant risks in females that don't exist in men. And that's obviously the detail of what I'm going to speak to you about. But there's actually a broader concept here: is that there are many areas of medicine where doctors have traditionally just treated people as though they are humans and they don't recognize these sex differences. So this is another area where sex matters. And I remember when I was an honors student many years ago, we were doing research, and the thing we were told at the very beginning is don't study women. When you do your research, so for instance, I studied uh, my, my, my very first, the very first research I ever did was we stuck a bunch of cyclists in a heat chamber and we measured their performance and muscle activation and body temperature and heart rate and so on in response to different temperatures. And the message was that you should only study men because otherwise you get complications that are induced by the menstrual cycle and female hormones. So everyone said, okay, fine. So literally, this, and I'm telling you, this is, I mean, yeah, this is how it was. This is how, this is how sports science, I can't speak to other fields, evolved. Was, <laughs> there, was a, there was a box for too hard and female research was put into the too hard box. It's, and now, now I'm working in rugby, and I'm going to show you some... I, I think we're on the cusp of doing really exciting research, which, by the way, I wish we didn't have to do. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather there was no concussion to study at all, but there is. And rugby have the opportunity to study it, but you'll see in a moment how big the disparity is between what is known in men and what is known in, in women. It's enormous. And so this is an illustration of the problem where sex matters and with respects to medicine. So, concussion, unique differences in women is what this is about. I got the date wrong, sorry. So what I would like from this presentation is for you to appreciate why concussion has never been treated in a spe sex-specific way. It's just because so little is known. I mean, usually there's a disclaimer in a scientific presentation that a lot of what I say may be different in a few years' time. This is almost certainly true here. We, we know so little, it's really, it's really amazing. Um, the second thing is to understand why these sex dif recognition of sex differences may affect not only risk but also severity in, in women. So we think, based on emerging evidence, that the likelihood of a concussion is higher in females and the consequences of those concussions may be more severe. We don't know why they may be, but that's the thinking, it needs to be studied. And then recognize some unique approaches, and I can only speak from the perspective of rugby, so I apologize if I leave out sports that you are more familiar with, the lacrosse, basketball, soccer, football, and so on that, that exist. So by soccer, I mean football. Soccer, I must remember. So world, world Rugby just came up with a strategy in 2021 um, which has a significant component of women's rugby because women's rugby is by far, and by, when I say by far, I mean in an order of magnitude, the fastest growing division in rugby. It really is growing enormously quickly. There's a World Cup later this year. It was meant to be last year in New Zealand. It had to be rescheduled because of COVID. It will be twice the size of the previous one, which was twice the size of the one before that. So world rugby is on an exponential growth curve, and it's very exciting for the sport. That's true because it's very new. And you'll see how new in a moment. And then at the same time, world rugby has got a player welfare strategy, which is the area of the business that I'm involved in, and one of the pillars on that player welfare strategy is the dedicated focus on the women's game. So we really are significantly invested in trying to make up for lost time and to bridge the gap of what is not known about not just concussion, but women's performance, women's nutrition, women's injury risk. There's more injuries than just concussion, of course, in our sport. By way of background, 
uh, you, I don't know if you've seen the movie with Will Smith playing the Nigerian doctor, Benedict Amalu concussion. We have the same issue in rugby. There's a lawsuit that was announced about 18 months ago and is heading towards, well, trial settlement, who knows. Uh, similar claim to what the NFL faced for not reacting and recognizing concussion. So the concussion question is the number one thing for world rugby on player welfare. So it's, it's important is the point I'm trying to get to. And women's injuries particularly are important because we know so little. Now I want to show you a couple of clips of what it looks like. This is a match from earlier this year between Ireland and Green Wales in red. And I've got three, three examples to show you of concussions that have happened uh, to women. The player in question here is going to be wearing a green jersey and with black hair. I think it's number 12 or 11. It's this player making the tackle now, there. And I want you to... I want you to look at the first five seconds after the impact. That's the key five seconds. The reason I'm giving you this background is to just try and help you understand how we research these questions, how we manage and research concussion. So the first five seconds is the key. So, okay, slow to get up, very unsteady to get up, makes their way back into position. And if you only started watching now, there's nothing wrong. And so you have a window of about four or five seconds in which you know that something's happened there. This is the mechanism. You'll see her head hits the elbow slash shoulder of the ball carrier there. And then she goes down with the injury. So that's the first one. The second one, and we're going to visit this one again in, the, in a bit later, because this is, this is an example of a con type of concussion that we think affects women much, much more than men. And it's very important in the differences. The person to watch now is the player carrying the ball here as she's tackled, head onto ground. Now again, watch the first five seconds. Motionless. So that's either a loss of consciousness or suspected loss of consciousness. And as the pa camera pans right, you'll see she's still down. The doctor comes on. At this moment, she's already diagnosed as concussed, right? We have, a, we have an operational definition that says that that doesn't need testing. That's a concussion. You know, straight off, immediate removal, players concussed. That's unique in sports, incidentally. Other sports would test this player. We, we say, basically, that's a concussion. And the mechanism of that, head onto ground, you'll see it here. That is, a, that is I hesitate to say a woman-specific, but that is a concussion that happens much, much more in women than in men, based on the data we have so far. And then here's the third one. This is going to be a head clash between two players, and both of them get injured. So there it is. And in actual fact, the green 13 gets ejected from the game because we've made this illegal. You, we, we've, we've uh, anyway, I'll, let me not interrupt the video. I'll tell you the story in a moment. So you'll see she comes into the tackle in an upright position. The consequence is that two players' heads share airspace, and then there's a clash of heads. And you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, imagine two heads at speed. It's not, that's never ending well. So this is obviously high risk, and that's what's happened there. The green player is okay, which is unusual. The white player goes off for a screen, and so she does go for a test. I'll tell you about that test in a moment. And as I say, the end result of this is that is that the green, the Irish player gets actually shown a red card, which is like an ejection in, in your sports, right? So that's, thanks, <laughs> have an early shower, so to speak, right? And that's... So that's game over for her. Interestingly enough, she, she's actually the player representative on World Rugby's player agency and is a wonderful, wonderful person. And so that's just an accident. It's... And what, so the, the, the risk there existed because both players were upright. What you get is then heads sharing airspace, risk of a collision between two players' heads. One of them or both are going to come off quite badly from that. And so we've made it illegal to tackle upright with head-to-head -head contact. And that's the reason she gets this punishment, because we're trying to discourage the thing that we know causes the injury. It's a battle. I'll tell you that much for free. It's, I don't know if we'll ever win that battle, but we're trying. So what, what happens next, and I want to give you the background, is when that player, whether it was the Irish 12, the English player at the end, the Italian player wearing the headgear, when, when they have that head injury, 
we classify them in one of three ways. There's a criteria one, which is an, let's call it for lack of a better word, an obvious concussion. You've lost consciousness. I showed you a clip of that. You're what's called ataxic. That's the position where she sort of gets up and she's stumbling. That, that shows you that there's some damage to the motor area of the brain. She can't, it's, a, it's like a boxer trying to get up after a blow. Those, those fall into what we call criteria one. There are 11 signs. And if anyone sees them, a referee, a doctor, uh, a medical observer in the stands, if you see that, that player's off. It's a concussion and they're gone. Game over for them. And they then enter our concussion protocols. Criteria two is a subtle case where you say, okay, that could be a concussion, but we need to test. That player leaves the field and has a sideline screen. It takes about 10 minutes to complete. If they pass that test, they can come back on and finish the game. If they fail that test, they have to stay off. So it's kind of like a return to play screen followed by follow subsequent tests the day after the game. And then sometimes what happens is you get cases that come to you the day after the game and say, you know, I'm nauseous, I was dizzy last night, light sensitive. Those then are picked up as delayed concussions. So we have three ways in which we can identify head injuries. What then happens is we've got something called an HIA, which is a head injury assessment process. So the player then gets tested, HIA 1, game day. HIA 2, night after the match, well, that night of the match. And HIA 3, two days later. Those are the diagnostic tests. That's where we assess whether the player has a concussion. So for example, there's a memory test, there's a, a symptom assessment, there's cognitive tests. For One of them is, I'm going to give you a list of three digits. I want you to repeat them backwards, back to me. So I'll say 472. You'll say? And then it's four. So then it's 3165. Yeah. I've done this, by the way, when I've given presentations and the guy fails. And, oh, gosh. <laughs> Failed on three. Just sit down. You've had too much to drink. So... <laughs> Anyway, there's cognitive, there's a memory test where they get read a list of 10 words, sunset, monkey, beach, picnic, table, chair, whatever, and they've got to say them back. Those, those tests are all compared to what was measured as a baseline test in that player. So at the start of a season, that player goes through this testing, and that sets their baseline, and they're assessed relative to those, which is one of the first areas that becomes interesting when we start looking at men and women, because men and women perform very differently in baseline tests. Women perform much better at cognitive tests, not as well at balance, and they have many more symptoms. I'll show you in a moment exactly what that looks like. And so we've got differences in those. Now, I said at the upfront how little data there is for men and women, uh, for women compared to men. In professional rugby, we've got 13,000 baseline tests that we can analyze. In women's rugby, we've got 700. That's the, that's the difference in knowledge. In the one group, the one sex, we have 13,000, and in women's rugby, we've got literally one year's worth. Within the next two years, we'll have 4,000 for a woman, and that's why I say it's actually exciting. We've got so much data. Again, I wish I didn't have it, but we do. But to show you, that's the size of the disparity that exists in that regard. So this is the point I was making, is that when we look at those baseline tests in men and women rugby players, we see very big differences. This is a crazy graph on a screen so small. But basically, what you're looking at running from top to bottom is a list of 22 symptoms that the player gets asked for. So for instance, um, gosh, uh, sadness, irritability, more emotional, um, I can't see that, nervous or anxious. Uh, do you have trouble sleeping? Do you have sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to light? This, this little dashed line here, shows you a one-to-one -one ratio between men and women. Anything to the right means women have more of that symptom at rest. In other words, all of them, right? <laughs> you don't have to read that in great detail to understand. So basically, we can draw that line here, and we can say anything here is where women are more likely to report a symptom at rest, and anything to the left is where women are more likely to report, oh, sorry, where men are more likely or women less likely to report. And so you can see pretty much across the board, with one or two exceptions, women at rest are more likely to tell their doctors that they are sad, irritable, emotional, anxious, lack, lack of sleep, uh, dizziness, etc., etc. Now, the question is, what do you do with that as a doctor? Because that, that's probably not physiological. That's in a way, that's likely to be a reporting function, but this is where we don't know, you see, because remember, these, these are players at rest. This is before the season started. 
There's no injury event. There's no anything that might trigger that. There's no known physiological, physical stimulus that triggers that. And so what people don't know is the source of that. There's two, obviously, schools of thought. One is that it could be real, but the other one, and there's a researcher from Michigan, I think, called Tracy Kovacin, who's the world leader in this, has done thousands of studies like this, and they suggest that it's likely a reflection of attitude and behaviors towards these medical screens, that women are more likely to endorse things that men are more likely to hide. I don't know that that's, that seems like an oversimplification to me, but that's the state of thinking at the moment. That's where we are at the moment, and we'll, the relevance of which we'll come back to in a moment. What about the actual risk of playing the sport? How likely are you to be concussed? This is in the last three World Cups. So that's 2010, 2014, 2017 for women. And I'll show you men as well, going back to 2011. That's the risk of injury in women. And you can see that it's trending upwards. Not good. We, we measure injury per 1,000 hours. And as if you played 1,000 hours of rugby, how many injuries would you be likely to get, is what we're saying for risk. And that's the risk of concussion for women. So you can see concussion make up... It, it may look small, but it's still the most common injury in women. That's the risk of injury in men and the risk of concussion in men. So a couple points here. One is the overall risk is higher in men than in women. The concussion risk is slightly higher in men than in women, but the trajectory of the two lines is different. That's a reflection of the fact that women's rugby is still in a sense, quite immature. It's developing very quickly. We've got data on the size and the mass of women players, and it is growing so quickly. As the sport has become more professional and more advanced and more women take up rugby, it is improving at a massively quick rate. It's almost like the, the sports equivalent of puberty, changing big time, very fast. So, a couple of points here. The overall in incidence in women is lower but going up. Then it says concussion in men is, and is the same as in women. There's no difference in, in the overall risk of concussion for men and women. But because the overall risk for women is, is lower, in other words, this line is lower for women than men, these concussions represent a greater proportion of injuries for women than for men. So as a relative risk, concussion makes up almost a third, sorry, just over a quarter of women's injuries and only 15% of men's injuries. So this is why we're concerned, is because it would appear, based on the data that we have, that there's a possibility that women are more likely to suffer concussions than other injuries. Overall, still the same. That's just because they play a different game, and it's changing in a direction that we, we might be concerned about because the trajectory is going up over time. Now, when we look at other sports, and this is where we have data from the aforementioned Tracy Kovacin and others here in the U.S., this is NCAA data because this is where you have at least some comparable data between sports. What we find, the, in, the, in all these graphs, by the way, the green line is going to be showing you, let me just make sure I get this right, the green line is showing the risk in uh, women and the blue line is the risk in men of concussion. So, the picture, I think. Uh, yes, sorry, that's... that's the, even on this screen, I can't see it, so I am very sorry. So they are the names of the sports, yes. So, ice hockey, soccer, basketball, softball, and then overall. And this is across a few thousand players over about nine or ten seasons that Tracy kovacin has got data. So don't worry about the numbers too much. Worry about the gap, because that gap represents the risk to women of concussion that has increased relative to men. So across pretty much all of them. The only exception is lacrosse, by the way, where apparently, and I stand corrected on this, I've only read it in the papers, the rules are slightly different, and that's why they think that the risk in women is lower, because they've changed the rules. In these sports, men are less likely, oh, so let me phrase that the other way, women are more likely to sustain a concussion than, than men are, right? So, basically, in ice hockey, it's 10% increase. In soccer, that's almost a 50% increase. Basketball, 40. Softball, twice as high. And the overall risk according to Kovacin, is about 40% higher risk for women than it is for men. And those are in comparable sports, right? The other thing that's not shown there, but it has been found, is that the severity of concussion is higher in women than in men. So we measure severity by how many days after that injury did you miss before you came back? And the answer is that in women for soccer injuries, for instance, it's about 50% longer. In basketball, it's about 30 to 40% longer. It takes women longer to recover from concussion than it does men. 
So, the problem here, and this is the problem affecting all the research in this space, is that these concussions are only diagnosed through self-report. These sports, until some of them recently, but some of them even now, don't yet have an objective, independent observer system to pick up the concussions that happen. They rely on the player to go to the doctor. And so we never can tell, and I mentioned earlier when it comes to symptoms, nobody knows whether that higher symptom in women at rest is a function of physiology or is it a function of reporting. We have the same issue here, which makes things quite tricky. So the diagnosis is almost always left to some sort of subjective discretion in combination with self-report, and there's no gold standard to identify it. So we don't know whether this is a reporting artifact, whether it's a neurological one, or of course, and this is almost always the case, it's never likely to be one or the other, it's a combination of the two. So that's the first big question that we have to try and tease out. Now, I've shown you this already. That's at rest on the left-hand side. After sport, number of differences. The type of symptom endorsed by men and women is likely to be different. Women are more likely to report drowsiness, sensitivity to light headaches and fatigue and concentration. Men are more likely to report amnesia and confusion. So that's statistically been shown that a concussion can manifest in different symptoms. Women have been shown to have greater impairments in cognitive function. That's the digits test I gave you, the words. They do some visuospatial tests. There's, there's different, there's, there's, depending on which tool you're using, there's probably a dozen or so different cognitive tests. Reaction time and visual memory. They have tracking tests where you have to keep your head, you have to move your head and keep your eye on a, on a stationary target. Women perform worse after concussion than men do after concussion. Uh, potential long-term effects. One study in adolescent athletes aged 14 to 15 showed that the average time for men is, let's call that one and a half months, for women, three and a, uh, two and a half months. That's a big difference between, I mean, 75 days, and it's been shown also that 73% of, that should actually be girls, need academic provisions. In other words, they have to be given permission to miss school for a while because the concussion costs them that time. So these are real world effects that have to be managed differently in girls compared to boys. You know, only 42% of boys report academic implications to a concussion. Uh, another one is that an elite professional football is in Sweden. Time to return is twice as long in women as it is in men. And women report almost three times more symptoms two days later, and they have symptoms three months after the concussion. Men don't. Now, there's a, there's a really simplistic and I think lazy explanation We've surveyed players in rugby, and we've said to them, have you ever had a concussion that you didn't report? Have you ever had a concussion that you knew you still were suffering from, but you told your doctor you were okay? In other words, did you lie about your symptoms? And of course they say yes. Why? Oh, because we didn't want to miss time. We didn't want to lose my place in the team and so forth. So that's what a lot of people will tell you is happening here, is that men are likely to lie and women are not. That seems really reductionist and lazy to me. Our data show that the women are just as likely, and of course that's the case, because why should women not also be competitive? So there's a lazy explanation for this, and there's a complicated one, and I don't know the answer to the complicated one yet, but that's what we have to explore, right? That's, that's the thing, so, so no one knows that. Now there are, you see, that's because and I'm not a neurologist, and I don't wish to pretend that I am, but there are potential neurological mechanisms, and there are studies that we need to do to think about some of these one of them is it's been shown that in women there, are, there is increased blood flow and metabolic rates in the female brain. Now, one of the consequences of a concussion is an interruption to that blood flow. And it's possible that the relative change in blood flow and the metabolic rate to the female brain is greater than in men, and that's what causes these prolonged symptoms, the cognitive mal uh, not malfunction, the prolonged cognitive dysfunction, etc. So that's but you can appreciate how difficult this is to study. You've got to get that concussed player as quickly as possible into some pretty expensive and complicated neurological scans as early as possible. The, the, the area that we have identified as the one that is, in a sense, the low-hanging fruit, the one that we have the most control over, is that it has been shown that the same impact is likely to cause a greater acceleration in women than in men. So in other words, an impact to the head because remember, the mechanism of a concussion is either that rotational or it's linear acceleration. It's kind of like, um, I don't have a glass, but you can imagine a glass of water and you drop a ping pong ball into it. 
That's your brain inside your skull. And if you shake the glass, the ping pong ball bounces back and forth between the sides of the glass. That's a concussion. So it's not direct blow. It's actually sometimes on the other side of where the blow is. Or it's a rotation that causes shearing or torsional forces. Or otherwise, it's a whiplash where you actually whip backwards and it's actually on the front of the head you get the injury. So regardless, though, in women, the early evidence suggests that there's greater acceleration. And that's possibly a consequence of neck strength differences between the sexes, which shouldn't be anything new to those of you who've listened to these lectures all morning and afternoon. And the other thing that we're trying to juggle in rugby is sports exposure and ability to take tackles. Um, I don't know what it's like in contact or collision sports in this country, but where I'm from, if you are a six, seven-year-old boy, you are playing rugby, <laughs> whether you like it or not. You're probably playing rugby. Um, similarly, Carol showed you videos earlier of children, boys, not children, boys, let's be specific here, who wrestle and fall and play in ways that develop the ability to handle contact. In South Africa, no girls play rugby. It's not offered at school sports. Most of the women who play rugby for South Africa take the sport up at the age of 17, 18, 19, even older. And the one theory that we've got is that they simply haven't acquired the technical skills to take contact and to be tackled and to fall. Falling is a skill. <laughs> and that video I showed you of that athlete falling and hitting their head on the ground, that may very well be a consequence of not learning the skill of falling and protecting yourself in that motion. So that's a very interesting area where we think we've got levers. We think we have ways to potentially change that. And I want to explore some of those. There's a really interesting study came up where they do these head perturbation trials. And so this is what they set you up with. You're blindfolded and you're connected to a basically a cord that is then connected to a little transducer at the back here. And what's going to happen is that without warning or with warning, because you see they do it, they either do it unanticipated, where they tell you sometime in the next 30 seconds, and then it happens. <laughs> or they tell you, five, four, three, two, one, and then it happens. And then that, what happens is that, that little cord will apply a force to this person's head. And what they're measuring is the muscle activation to try and control the head movement. So if you, for a second, remember the head's going to be pulled backwards. If you, and, and obviously the muscles are now going to try and counteract that by going forward. So if you put your, your hand on your forehead, and you feel these muscles, these are the ones working, right? If you push your head into your hand, you'll feel these muscles, yeah? That's the muscles that they're trying to measure. So you'll see in this picture, I explained that very poorly, I hope you understand now. They, they've got little EMG sensors, so that what they're going to measure here is how much electrical activity is in those muscles. In other words, how well and how quickly can I activate my muscles in order to stop my head snapping back? Because that's the thing that's going to stop the acceleration. So this is quite interesting. And then what they do is they do a maximum test. So how strong is that muscle? And so this is what they find, right? So unsurprisingly, the girth of the neck is 13% higher in men than women. So, or 13% lower in women than men, right? Let's phrase it that way. The maximum strength, so in other words, the strength of that muscle is 51% lower in women than it is in men. This is, we've seen so many examples. We've seen shoulder kick, everything. It turns out neck strength the same way. Go figure, yeah? Then what's really interesting is that in response to that yanking of the thing on the back of my head, women activate 62% of the muscle available in the neck. Men only have to activate, so, sorry, not 62%. Women have to activate 62% more muscle than men to control that movement. So what's really interesting, and, and then the final point is, what does the muscle activation look like before impact? Because if I came to you, for instance, and I said, okay, I'm going to push your head back in five seconds, you would activate the muscle before I pushed your head back because you're able to anticipate. So that's really interesting. clever. You know, the body is like that. The brain is smart. Women activate more muscle before the anticipated head contact than men. Even when it's unanticipated, women are bracing for impact because remember they tell them it's like in the next 30 seconds we're going to hit you with, well, we're going to yank your head back. Women are activating more muscle there. So the first, the first finding is that women have higher muscle activation not only after the force is applied but even in anticipation of it. And then what's really interesting is that in men there's no difference, anticipated or unanticipated. In women, it goes down when they don't anticipate it. So in other words, when you're surprised, you weren't, you weren't ready. It's like I'm not braced for impact. 
And that only happens in the women in this particular study. This is, and that's a small difference, but it might be a meaningful difference. And so when the load is unanticipated, women's muscle activation is slightly lower than when it is anticipated. So the point of this study is that in response to head loading, men, men can rely on a different mechanism to control the head. They've got size and strength. Women have to use neuromuscular adaptations. And the problem now that we're dealing with in sport, and it, that's why it's so interesting to me to hear Carol give me an explanation for this, is that women may never learn muscle neuromuscular anticipation in the same way that boys do because of testosterone that changes the nature of play. So people say it's behavioral. Yeah, but the behavior is physiology too, right? So that's really interesting. But what it does give us, us being rugby and potentially you in your sports, skateboarding, for instance, you must fall a lot. I, I would have. That's why I never did it. What it does give us is a locus of control or potential intervention. So again, I want to play you this clip because this clip best illustrates what we think we can try and avoid. And again, the ball carrier goes down and just hits the ground in a way that you, okay, you see it sometimes in men's rugby, but not often. Because men learn how not to do that, and they've got a stronger neck. So the question we're asking now is, if we could get this ball carrier to anticipate that, to have a skill of falling, and let's tuck the neck maybe, and activate the muscles a bit better, could we avoid that head ground impact? That's the question. Because this might be part of the reason why women are more vulnerable to concussions than men, is that snap onto the ground. So, so yeah, so that's where, we, that's where we're putting a lot of our efforts, and I'll show you wh what that looks like in a moment. There are other physiological mechanisms by which women might be more at risk of concussion. One of them is the hormonal differences. You know, this is the thing, when I, as I said, when I was studying uh, my honors degree, they told us not to worry about it. Turns out it might be quite a big deal. <laughs> but the instructions, we got, we never, we'd never bothered. But one of so the really interesting things is that in the menstrual cycle, there's some evidence that if you suffer a concussion in the luteal phase, the symptoms may become worse as a consequence of progesterone, uh, disruption of progesterone uh, production by the body. Whereas when... So, so in other words, what, what the, the theory in this particular instance is that um, in the phase of the menstrual cycle where the progesterone levels are the highest, that disruption is relatively greater than when progesterone levels are lower, and that might be part of the mechanism. And there are a couple of studies going on in the world at the moment looking at whether oral contraceptives are protective against concussion. Now, please don't think... Th th I'm not saying they are. I'm saying that that remains a question. And we've... We're funding, World Rugby is funding a study right now looking at that exact thing. Is does, and you may have heard, you may have seen that ACL injuries are more likely in women for similar reasons. There may very well be a role for the menstrual cycle and therefore contraceptives in concussion. Now, I don't, that's a clinical question about how we act upon that in the future. But what do we do with all this? Now, obviously, there is a lot. One of them is communication. You know, sports have a duty of care to their players. The NFL was liable for the lawsuit because they neglected the duty of care and candor, um, in particular candor. You have to communicate the risk, you know, and I think it's important, like, if we, we can't, we, we cannot and should not continue to treat rugby players as rugby players in a human category when there may very well be differences in risk between male and female. You have to be honest about this and say it might be the case. It might not be, but we don't know until we look, and that's the point of the research. Then the second thing is clinical care. You know, the fact that the fact that women endorse more symptoms and report symptoms at baseline must change my approach as a doctor when I assess a person after a suspected injury, because how can I interpret what that person is going through independent of understanding? And again, that's that's where it's tricky because you don't want to treat the typical case; you want to treat the individual but it pays to know what differs between people. Do persistent symptoms mean something different in men compared to women? I've shown you that women are much more likely to have persistent symptoms after a concussion. Does that require a different clinical intervention or no? We know that rest isn't good for concussion. Exercise actually is, but maybe the timing and the dosage of that exercise needs to be different. We don't know these things. So, so much still, you know, the, the page is very much blank. And then the last thing is coaching, and that's, the, that's the bit about the falling and the neck strength. If we understand the risks, we might be able to target prevention strategies. And so we've got two big studies. One of them is being funded in Canada, 
and the other one's being funded in New Zealand, where we are doing interventions that strengthen the neck. You know, we've got studies, again, it's on boys, boy rugby players, not women. But 15 seconds a day of doing this, pushing my head against my hand forward, right, left, and back. They reckon can reduce the risk of concussion by 30%. I mean, that takes a minute a day, and you can maybe get a 30% difference. Because all you're doing is you're, you're activating that isometric neck strength, and that's exactly what's going to be required as you're about to hit the ground. So we've got these big studies, but in women, you see that the mechanism might be different. That happens more in women. So in actual fact, there might be a bigger benefit, but we also have to teach tackle technique in a way that might be different to men because, as I say, boys have, boys have been tackling for 15 years by the time they play at that level. Girls have been tackling for 15 weeks. And so there's a... There's a big focus in how we go about educating and, and instructing and doing these strengthening exercises that might need to differ. So there's a lot there. I mean, it's, and you know, it's, it's like frustrating to reach, the, well, I'm not quite at the end of the talk, but the point is like you get to the end of the talk and you say, well, we don't really know much, but we'll let you know in a few years. But that's the, that's the truth. One other thing, and this came up in our transgender guidelines workshop, is that, so what's, we, we asked a biomechanist to model how speed and mass affect head injury risk. Because when we were having our discussions at the transgender group, we said men are heavier by 30%, faster by 10 to 15%. And people said, so what? Okay. <laughs> I still didn't ever think I'd have to explain why being faster and more powerful and heavier makes a difference, but let's try. <laughs> uh, and what I did, and actually it's a bit of a regret, it was a misstep. Um, I'll tell you why in a moment. Is, we got a biomechanist to model this because he had a model where you basically test crash test dummies like you see when they test cars <laughs> and you make them collide with one another at different speeds and weights and so on. And you say, how much does the head weigh? How much does the person weigh? So what you're looking at is linear acceleration of the head, right? And yellow is bad, blue is good. So this is the linear acceleration of the head. This is high, this is low. This is the speed of the tackler, so that's the player making the tackle, and this is the speed of the ball carrier. And what you will notice is that for any tackler speed, as the ball carrier runs faster, we get more yellow, more, more, more risk of head acceleration. And for any ball carrier speed, we get greater risk uh, so at, as tackler speed goes up, right? So obviously, if both players go fast, now we enter dangerous. That's obvious. The faster you go, the more likely there's a risk. What's quite interesting is that the mass differences uh, work the other way around. So for any, sorry, let me go there. So for any ball carrier, so for any tackler mass, as the ball carrier gets heavier, the risk to the tackler goes up. Make sense? Yeah, you with me? But for any ball carrier mass, as the tackler gets heavier, the risk actually goes down. So when it comes to speed, it's the combination of speed that makes the difference. When it comes to mass, it's the disparity in mass that makes the difference. And that was part of the rationale why we argued that having a, a, a trans woman who weighed 107 kilograms coming into women's rugby with faster speeds was going to create risk. And in the end, <laughs> two, two unions rejected it because it was theoretical, not real modeling. So there you go. So that's why it was a misstep, because we gave them a loophole. So what we have is a program called Activate, which is an injury prevention program. As I said, that one had been extensively researched, but only in boys. And the funding that has been allocated is now going to ask whether it works as effectively in girls and whether there are modifications that may need to be made to not only teach people muscle strength, but muscle activation, timing, coordination. But this is very much a long game, you know. So every action and intervention here, we've got short-term, medium, and long-term components to it. And it will take us a long time before we actually have a definitive answer. And I always talk about three generations it takes to cause any change, you know. The first one rejects it. The second one kind of grudgingly accepts it. And on the third one, you perfect something. And right now, we have, a, we have a knowledge base that's too thin to build a skyscraper on. So we have to be humble and start by just trying to lay the foundations. And as I said to you, we've got 13,000 tests in men and 700 in women. That's not good enough. In the next few years, we'll have three or 4,000 in women, and we will grow that knowledge exponentially. But overall, because I know I've dived a little bit into the weeds, especially the second half of this talk, I think the point that has to be made is that sports have to be encouraged to recognize that these differences between men and women, male and female, could be quite significant. 
when we talk about sex matters to performance, sex may very well matter to injury even more. And until we start looking, we won't know that. And so irrespective of I'm here talking on behalf of rugby, you, I know many of you are swimming, many of you are other sports, but you have to make that investment and, and understand that you can't, you can't just apply what's been done over 30 years by honest students like myself who, who put women in the too difficult box <laughs> and then hope to, hope to deliver a good standard of care on the side of injury. So, yeah, thanks for your time and attention. And, uh, yeah, with, with, with that, I'm going to hand over to Kim to, to release you into the bar. <laughs>